Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ian Nielsen, and today I will be talking about characterization of long wavelength in gas nanopillar lasers on silicon. So, in traditional processors, the tr processing speed has been increasing recently, and many of you have computers, I assume, and how fast is your processor? Just yell out some numbers, if you know. One megahertz. One terahertz. <laughs> okay, so the speeds nowadays are bottlenecking at around 3.8, somewhere above that general area. So, let's start at this. We have been trying to find alternatives to make processors even faster nowadays. And so, one of those alternatives is optical interconnections with electronics. And so, the reason we want to use optical interconnections is that they're extremely fast, they're extremely energy efficient, and they're rather inexpensive. And so, in order to do this, in order to put optical interconnections onto silicon chips, this is what my project was, uh, we need an on-chip light source. So, in order to do that, we have to grow lasers onto the silicon chips. So, a laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So, you have your two essentials, the pump source and your gain medium. Now, gain medium is what actively amplifies the light that goes through it, and the pump source is what excites that gain medium. So, as you can see here, we have our normal spontaneous emission, which if you increase the pump light or the pump source power, you will get a higher intensity. So, what you do to get a laser is you add in two mirrors to make an optical cavity, which, in terms, the light, once inside the gain medium, will bounce back and forth between these mirrors until it is emitted as a laser. And, on a PL spectrum, you will see that a certain wavelength will have an extreme intensity which is your lasing peak. And to know that if it's a true laser, it has to be a relatively small area of wavelength so that it only emits that wavelength and it's a true laser. So you have true color, as in this laser pointer. It's red as that wavelength. So now, we grow what are called, in gas now, or just nanopillars. Uh, so the gain mediums in most uh, lasers are created by three, five materials. So R35 material is indium gallium arsenide, so that's what INGAS stands for. So how we grow these nanopillars, I wasn't actively in the growth program, but they do grow them, by metal organic chemical di vapor di position, which essentially is doping a substrate and having the chemicals align themselves on the substrate into these certain structures. So. In previous uh, papers, people have created gallium arsenide needles as they grow on a hexagon structure, or hexagonal, and what we do, we incorporate indium, which is another three material, into that nanopillar, which stunts the growth vertically and expands it. So that's why we have nanopillars instead of nano needles. And so there is a lattice constant mismatch within the silicon and the nanopillars, thus we have to be careful about how much indium we incorporate or else the nanopillars will break and turn into ugly deformed areas, which I'll show you in a few slides. So, er, there we go. Um, these nanopillars act as lasers as the in-gas core works as a gain medium and the gallium arsenide shell works as a layer of passivization, which keeps out the outer materials and whatnot. And in the hexagonal structure, there's internal reflection, so it goes around in a helix fashion, and it will emit a laser. Now, previous results of these indium gallium arsenide lasers have incorporated 20% indium into their nanopillars, and have gone, or have retrieved, received, uh, lasing peaks at the wavelength of 950 nanometers. In order to place, in order to get the light source to go into the silicon chip itself, we need 
those wavelengths to go higher. So in order to push that indium composition, the most straightforward approach is to just incorporate 30% alone. And this is what happens. This is the lattice constant mismatch problem, and they become deformed, as you can see on the sides of this nanopillar, and cracked. So what we did instead is we did a graded indium composition, which we put in the indium in layers of differing percentages. So we have the 20, 25, 30, 35, or 25, 20, and then the gallium arsenide layer on top of the silicon substrate. And as you can see here, we want an area of around 30% indium for 1.1 microns of wavelength. So we increase that. And now I'm going to talk about photoluminescence. This is the key to understanding, or not understanding, but recognizing a decent laser from a bad laser. So, in simple terms, it's the absorption and following re-radiation of a photon from a material. So what actually happens is once you shoot a pump light, or <coughs> what we use as a laser, you shoot a pump light at a substance, the substance, an electron will absorb the photon shot at it, and it'll go to a higher unstable energy level. And it wants to go back down to a stable energy level, so what it will do, it will jump back down and in the process re-emit a photon, which we call the signal light from the substance. So this is our photoluminescence setup. <laughs> Let me go back here so I can point out things. It looks confusing. Don't worry, I'm going to explain it. Okay? So we start off with our titanium sapphire laser, which is our pump source. It goes through a neutral density filter, which is just essentially to tone down the intensity of the laser, and then it bounces off a few mirrors, goes through an iris to focus it again, and it goes through an SP filter, or a short pass filter, which effectively cuts out all the higher wavelengths of light, and only allows through the shorter wavelengths, in other terms, the short passing through. And then it goes through a filter wheel, which once again tones it down, and then another neutral density, and then it goes into a beam splitter, which in a perfect world, would shoot 50% of the light through by a trans Mission. transmission. Thank you. Um, it shoots through to a photo detector, which effectively reads out the power of the laser, and 50% of it will reflect off the internal part of it into the objective lens, which will focus onto the sample. And now our sample is in a cryostat that is pumped down and pumped through with liquid helium, which gets down to temperatures of four degrees Kelvin, and only four degrees Kelvin away from absolute zero. So it's really, really cold. Um, then, once it has hit a nanopillar, hopefully it will re-emit a signal light, which will go back through the beam splitter. There's gonna be an arbitrary 50% going through here. We don't care about that. We care about the 50% that gets gone through, and then it goes through a light, a long pass filter, which only allows longer wavelengths of light through, and then it'll go through another filter wheel into your spectrometer. And what the spectrometer does, it sends the light through a prism, which breaks it out into its individual wavelengths, and then it is shown onto an in-gas CCD, which made, Megan explained earlier what a CCD is. So then we take the readings from that CCD onto our computer, and we get the data from our readings. So, from after gathering all that data, the format of plotting it is really tedious and annoying. So, what I did, I created a program that automatically plots and analyzes the data. So, as you can see here, there's just a little bit of code, and your PL plot of what the data would look like. So this is just a simple flowchart of what the first part of my program does. So you have all your data in a single directory, and it will read in a single data file at a time. So if it has been attenuated by one of the filters, it will scale it appropriately, appropriately based off of the name. It will state if it has been attenuated, and then it will read the nanopillar index. And then if it's from a new nanopillar, it will start a new figure. So, and then the max finding, I like to think of it as you have a container of rocks. You're trying to find the biggest rock, but you can only take one at a time. So you take out a rock, it's pretty big. You 
take out another rock. If this rock is not bigger than this rock, you toss that rock and look for another. And if this rock is bigger than this rock, you toss that, keep this one in your right hand, and go back for more. So it essentially does that until there's another nano pillar, and then it will go back through here, label the previous plot with the previous max, read the max from the first data that it's reading, and it'll plot it on a new figure, and then it'll go back through the cycle all again. And this is what it will look like after it's gone through. So, as you can see, there is a lazing peak right here. And the next part of my program plots an LL curve, which is essentially the plot of the pump power against the lasing intensity of that certain laser. So what we do is we integrate the area underneath the peak and then plot it against its corresponding pump power in a log, a log, log scale. And this is what the program looks like. I'm not going to go into too much depth of what it actually does, but it does smooth it. As you can see in this graph, there is a little bit of noise. When you look further at it, it's pretty bad. But there is noise. It will smooth it out. And if there is a lazing peak beneath this maximum, it will go through with the program, but if there isn't, so if there's just a spontaneous emission, like the lowest one there, there's no peak, it will skip over it and look for another. So this is what an LL curve would look like. And to determine whether or not an L a laser is a good laser, there would be a small or a decent peak. It will make, moreover, an S shape as the smaller increments of pump power will give larger increases in the PL intensity. And so our results. From our high indium composition nanopillars with the graded structure, we did retrieve wavelengths, lasing wavelengths of higher wavelength. Um, than previously shown. So our lasing wavelength was around 130 nanometers, whereas previously, in previous experiments with the 20%, was only 950. And our spontaneous mission wavelength was around 10 hundreds, 1060 nanometers. And our, the previous were around 970. So in summary, we have high indium composition nanopillars grown on silicon wafers. The nanolab process of SEM, which I didn't talk about, just go back real quick to show you guys. So these pictures right here were taken with a scanning electron microscope. So that's what we took to look out and map out the nanopillars. And after that, our nanopillars did have a long wavelength over one micron achieved through optical pumping, and the automated function of the MATLAB program did plot and analyze the data efficiently. So that's that. Uh, any questions? On, on those images of the nanopillars, yes. the, uh, can you give us a sense of what scale we're looking at? Um, let's see. The nanopillars in these pictures, I think earlier I had a better, here we go. So this one, this nanopillar itself was about 2.8 microns tall and 908 nanometers thick in diameter. So they're still on the nanoscale, but they're just going over. Yes? Um, in order for the light to be emitted into the silicon waveguides, it has to go, it has to be transparent through the silicon. So over 1.1 microns, it will not be absorbed into the silicon, so it will pass right through into the waveguides. Anything else? I have one more question. Yes? What happens if you have two rocks of the same size? <laughs> <laughs> Very unlikely, but if that did happen, then the computer would fry up. <laughs> <laughs> it would 
find another one. If it's larger, then it will immediately kick those two out. Okay. So it's basically the same. So thank you, one more time. I want to thank everybody in the Shark group, so Avi, Evie, Aaron, Connie, and my family and the whole Shark group for helping me through this. And yeah, thank you guys.